Hello, and you are listening to an episode of the DD Geopolitics podcast. We are very honored to be joined today by Mr. Larry Johnson. Uh, he is a former CIA analyst, and currently he writes at his blog, Son of the New American Revolution, which we all highly recommend for his analysis of the current geopolitical framework that we all find ourselves in in this day and age, and what the course of the Ukraine war is, how to parse information, how to think about things, and also the flaws in the way things are often framed, particularly in the Western and especially American mainstream media. But we'll be getting more of his insights for you here directly today. Mr. Johnson, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, folks. So I wanted to start the interview by asking you first, and then we'll go drill down a bit more. How, what do you see as the overall situation being with regards to the war in Ukraine, not just, of course, the situation on the ground in general, but the war in Ukraine also in its larger context currently. I think what we're seeing is um, on let's let's start with Russia. Russia has awakened from its slumber. Uh, I, I think for many years there were several in leadership positions in Russia that held out hope that they could be integrated with the West that they could be treated with respect by the West, that they could trust the West, that there could form a genuine partnership. And I think the events over the last, well, we'll say 24 months, because it started you know, before the outbreak of the special military operation, uh, that Russia has discovered that they can't trust anybody in the West, nobody, that uh, whether it's the United States or NATO, they're liars. The European Union, they're duplicitous, and they they have only one thing in mind, which is the destruction of Russia, breaking it up into constituent parts. Um, the other sort of broad uh, takeaway, I guess, is that the West, at the outset of this, thought that they were bigger, better, smarter than Russia, and that Russia was hanging on only by a thread, and it just required some pressure, maybe economic, maybe military, maybe a combination of the two. And it would cause Vladimir Putin to be overthrown. Uh, it would uh, cause an upheaval in Russia across the board, and the West would be able to, again, consolidate and take power. And what they've discovered is, boy, that whole plan has blown up in their face big time that Russia's stated objectives of demilitarization and denazification in Ukraine have turned out to be not only the demilitarization of Ukraine, but it's the demilitarization of NATO. And I, I think people need to understand that at the outset in February of 2022, Ukraine represented the second largest army in NATO. Now you go, well, wait a second, they weren't a member of NATO. Well, they were not an official member of NATO, a de jure de, by law. But they certainly were a de facto member of NATO because every year since 2014, after the Maidan, they've been conducting joint military operations with both U.S. military command out of uh, Europe, UCOM, and with NATO. And up to and including uh, amphibious landings with U.S. Marines on Ukrainian territory in front of the Black Sea. So within that, after the United States, Ukraine actually represented the second largest army. Third largest army is Tur Turkey. <laughs> that means all the traditional European powers really, they talk tough, they puff their chests out, but they don't really have anything to bring to the conflict. And uh, there was a lot of, um, I think, private betting that Ukraine was going to be a, such a disruptive force to Russia that NATO would never have to worry about ever fighting Russia again. Um, and, you know, that has, uh, like I said, it's blown up in their faces in ways they never imagined. Uh, the most prominent being the new alliance between Russia and China and their complete rejiggering 
of the international order that was established and controlled by the United States since the end of World War II. And the, everything from the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the United Nations, uh, all of these institutions were largely under the control of the United States, not to mention the financial system. And, and, and that's all coming apart at the seams now, and nobody in the West has an answer. I think in your, one of your most recent articles, and indeed with one of your recent contributors' articles about the decline of competency and professionalism mm -hmm. in the West, <clears throat> and right. you, you're, and in that blog post you talked, there was a plan A and a plan B. But I think what it all goes down to is perhaps a failure to analyze things critically or perhaps correctly. Now, you were at the CIA, so you can probably correct me if I'm wrong here, but a uh, legendary analyst, Sherman Kent, had a analyst's trinity about everything that an analyst would want to be, which is to know all there is to know, to be believed, and to influence policymaking for the good. How far do you think that that is actually absorbed or taken on board within the wider intelligence community and more broadly, I guess we could say the U.S. security elite in terms of a way of thinking about about things and living by that and all that flows from that? Yeah, well, so so my take on being a, what I saw my job as an analyst was to know, you know, Kent's correct, know everything that you could possibly know and actually have some relevant experience in it. Um, and, and then don't come at it with just, you know, keep your opinions out of it. This is not supposed to be, intelligence analysis is not a sophisticated form of punditry. It's supposed to be more like the old television show in the United States, Dragnet, just the facts. Um, as far as influencing policy, that, I, I think that's a danger. And then that's what gets intelligence uh, and uh, analysts into into trouble if they make that their their priority, uh, it is up to uh, at least in the United States for the political people to make those decisions. If our if our government is based upon the premise that the politicians are elected and represent the will of the people, then it should not be the job of any intelligence analyst to try to put their finger on the scale to tip it one way or another. But what we're seeing is a complete breakdown in the, uh, let's call it meritocracy uh you know the two you were actually referencing two articles that were written by guest authors uh one's called observer r and the other is uh gaius baltar uh, gaius baltar's piece focused on the fact that because of the ideological uh, the, the focus on ideology and having an ideological purity test we have reached a situation where meritocracy, promoting people according to what they do and their accomplishments, has taken a back seat. And you're seeing that in just uh, uh, one example after another, the CIA. Most recently, um, when I was writing a piece about Niger, I looked up on the CIA's World Factbook about Niger and noticed they said that the coup had started in late April 2023. Well, the coup started late July. Now, I used to write for that publication. I mean, you know, every year they'd come and say, hey, update it. Or if there was some major event, you would update it. You write it, you know, you write it up, type it. It's then given to your branch chief, who's supposed to review it. And it's also given to an editor at the time, what was called the Office of Global Issues. So we're talking three levels of review. Through three, I can understand a junior analyst. Okay, they were stupid. But how does that explain the branch chief and the editor of the you know, the overall publication? How could three people who are, their job is intelligence get something so wrong? Now you say, well, that's a minor thing. Look, if they're making errors on that, what do you think they're doing on the big stuff? So the, what we're witnessing is this complete breakdown of objective analysis across the board in the West. And it, it leads to a variety of things. One, a gross underestimation of Russian capabilities, both militarily, economically. Um, second, it, 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 I, I've never seen such levels of delusion or fantasy that are prevalent in retired generals. Uh, there's this guy, one general, Breedlove, 
Uh, I think he was uh, uh, in charge of UCOM at one point. He he's on television saying, "Oh yeah, Ukraine's going to win this." I, on what planet is he living? Because there's no way for Ukraine to win this at all. Zero. It's impossible because Ukraine does not have the manpower. It does not have the economic foundation. It does not have the economic resources. It does not have air power for one thing, and it's not going to suddenly magically develop that. So when you add everything up, there's no way Ukraine can win. And instead of dealing with that fact, they continue to lie to the you know, to people in the United States and in Europe. Hmm. Larry, I have a question. So it's sort of a you know, like a regular person question, because this is an opinion that we see very often on our channel, just from the, the people who follow this war and are very invested. They say things like, what is Russia waiting for? Uh, because Russia needs to end this very quickly because NATO can keep this up, up forever. But you <laughs> mentioned that effectively NATO yeah. is getting demilitarized. Yeah. So could you please answer this question for all these people? How do you see this? Can NATO actually do this forever? Or are their resources limited? How are they, in your opinion, comparing to Russia in this respect? Yeah, we've seen already uh, clear evidence that, uh, well, let's call it the deindustrialization of NATO and the United States. Um, right now, the last estimate I saw, Ukraine was firing, for example, uh, six to 7,000 artillery shells, 155 millimeter shells. The United States, the, 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 the uh, corporation, the defense contractor that makes those shells can only produce 19,000 a month. Now they're saying they might be able to wrap up to 30,000 a month. Okay, let's do some simple math. If Ukraine is firing 6,000 a day, um, and there's 30 days in a month, my, you know, I'm not great at math, but that's 180,000 shells. What the United States can produce is one sixth of that. They can they could only come up maybe with thirty thousand eventually, but right now they're nineteen thousand. So right off the bat, we see that the United States no longer has an a switch it can flip and start producing this stuff. Uh, the same applies across the board in Europe. Uh, the the one country that was sort of the industrial power, Germany, they're they're in the process of turning the lights off over there. Uh, they're in an economic contraction. You know, it is people are still. I think people in the West still live with this World War II fantasy, because in at the start of World War II, after the the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and the United States declared war on both uh, Japan and Germany, the United States was an industrial beast. It was able to churn out uh, aircraft carriers built from start to finish, build them and uh, deploy them within two months. Uh, unheard of. Today, it's taking six years to build an aircraft carrier. They were oh, wow. they, got to, they got to the place where they could produce a combat aircraft within two days. So, I mean, it's just, it, it was a remarkable industrial uh, capability. Well, that is no longer present in the United States. I, I saw it firsthand. I grew up in the Kansas City, Missouri area, and I was in high school 50 years ago, graduating. And at that time, we had a steel plant. Uh, it was called Armco Steel. My dad was a, a foreman at that plant. There was Sheffield. Uh, there was Standard Oil, an oil refinery. One of my good friends, his father worked there. Bendix Corporation. They produced avionics and and uh, and other uh, equipment for aircraft. Uh, Alice Chalmers, who produced farm equipment, harvesters. Uh, two General Motors plants building cars. Those are all gone. They don't, they're not there anymore. And, and so all of that technical ability, which was able to you know, help, could be turned into military production, it doesn't exist. It's been sent to places like Mexico and into Asia. So here you, say, here you have the situation of, you know, Russia could choose 
to do massive waves of troops running them forward. They're not doing that. Uh, they're trying, one, to preserve and, and the loss of life on the side of Russia, and they're not causing mass casualties among Ukrainian civilians either, because, you know, stand a Ukrainian up next to a Russian and tell me how you tell the difference. You don't. They're the same. They're ethnically the same. So uh, the, this notion that, oh, Russia needs to finish this quick. Why? I, you know, why? Because the NATO is in the process of destroying itself. Are we? Would someone like to argue that NATO is more united today than it was uh, 18 months ago? Well, no, no, it's not. It's just the opposite. Is has NATO demonstrated that it has more military punch now than it did 18 months ago? Well, no, that's just the opposite. They're struggling to find equipment and weapons that they can send to Ukraine, and they've already sort of emptied their own storehouses and warehouses. Uh, and, and and let's be honest, the reason NATO keeps expanding is they need more troops because they don't have enough troops on their own. Uh, if Think of it this way. I, if, if you total up the armies of, of France, Germany, and the UK, the, they're about as large as the army in, in Ukraine. So <laughs> NATO, NATO I, I call it, it's a jobs program for white guys, you know, that... <laughs> They get the they, they get the command and draw a pension and uh, but but it's, it's not an effective military organization and part of what you know I think is still puzzling so many uh, and on the NATO side is all of these plans and tactics that they use so effectively against goat herders and camel jockeys in Afghanistan and Iraq is it working too well against the Russians? So, in your opinion, do you actually see? a threat of a direct Russian-NATO confrontation, because that's another thing that people are very scared of. They say yeah. that Russia needs to hurry up, and then they also say, well, uh, NATO perceives Russia as weak because we see that Russia is getting hit on its territory, and so eventually they're just going to act like they're not scared. They're going to see that there is nothing to be afraid of, and we're going to get into direct confrontation. No, I think I think the, the, that is what's frightening, um, and it's going to happen. It will happen more because of the, again the miscalculation of the West. Um, Russia's, um, you know, I, I did a lot of work in uh, Central America, South America, and in Spanish, there's an expression "se se confunde el bueno con el buenudo," which means they confuse being good with being a fool. And I think there is that danger here that they there's the misinterpretation of Russia's cautiousness as being incompetent uh, and lacking in both the military power and the will to do something. At least that is the perception on the Western side. But the West has very limited resources and a very long logistics tail. In other words, they can't just ring the fire bell and have all these troops come scrambling out of barracks, armed to the teeth and ready to go and just go marching off to, to stop the, the nasty Russians. Um, the United States, you remember going into the, uh, the war in, in that Iraq in 2003, it took the United States a good eight months to spin up and, and get the, the troops deployed and the logistics in place. And I don't see any of those kinds of movements right now. The, what you do have is uh, both the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions, the brigades of those units are deployed in Poland and Romania, respectively. There are a couple of armor brigades. A brigade is around 5,000 troops that have been deployed as well. And again, to supplement uh, the uh, paratroopers in, in both Poland and Romania. But, you know, that those those are nothing. I mean, they really they'd be speed bumps if they ever got into an actual conflict. So, the it is. Um, I, I worry that the United States, in its desperation, or the Poles in their desperation, or are, they've been in the process of trying to provoke a response from Russia, 
so that they can enact Article 5 and maybe try to bring all of NATO's power, so-called power, to bear. But I, I, I don't see the political situation throughout Europe as uh, with people growing stronger in their desire to do that. I think it's just the opposite. I think you're, you're finding an emerging anti-war sentiment across the board. Yeah, I would agree with that. I also personally don't don't think that it's likely, though. An interesting question is um, you know, that everyone is asking is how how it's going to end. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do, what do you see? Like, I guess, what scenarios do you see for how this conflict might end? And when actually do you see it ending? Because that's also another question that people ask and wonder about. Uh, there, there's a lot of talk about, uh, well, the, let me uh, rephrase that. The West wants to have an extended stalemate because they believe that if they can draw this war out, they will exhaust Russia and Russia will collapse into a puddle of tears and curl up into a fetal position. Uh, I, again, I think whoever's the people that hold that view they are in, they are doing some sort of hallucinogenic drug, uh, magic mushrooms maybe. That is um, the one that's going to be exhausted out of this is the West, not Russia. Uh, they keep failing to understand that Russia, number one, uh, as the richest country in the world in terms of natural resources, it is number one. And then on top of that. It actually has an industrial capability that's modern, robust. They can build their own planes. They can build their own trains. And they build their own spacecraft. And in fact, the level of sophistication in Russia on that front is such that the United States has been relying upon Russia over the last 19 years to carry our astronauts to the International Space Station because the United States lost its ability to build those rockets. I mean, it just, it's crazy. And yet, we, we pretend that Russia is this backward country. Uh, from an educational standpoint, Russia dominates. So how does this all factor into the end of the war? Uh, right now, Ukraine can only stay on the field of battle as long as the United States and NATO continue to send up money and weapons, period. If that stops, they're done, and they'll be done within two weeks. They will not have enough logistics to sustain operations beyond that. So it's really dependent upon what happens in the United States, in Germany, in France, and in the United Kingdom. And I think this this winter is going to be especially tough in Europe. I think the, the, we're not seeing signs of great economic growth. We're seeing signs of economic contraction. I think that's going to happen as well in the United States. So as economic pressures develop on both uh, the U.S. side and the European side of the, uh, of the ledger, the amount of money and the willingness to start to send more to Ukraine, it's going to dry up. That coupled with the failure of the Ukrainians on the field of battle, their counteroffensive has been a complete bust. Despite, you know, the some of some of the media is doing a, a desperate attempt to, you know, put lipstick on this pig and, and call it Marilyn Monroe, uh, but uh, the the fact of the matter is, Ukraine by ver not having combat air power, is at the outset was going to lose. They, they didn't have any way to penetrate Russian defenses. You've got to have some sort of credible uh, air threat. And, and Ukraine did not have that, does not have that, and is not going to have that, even if the United States manages to succeed in sending them 20 F-16s. They'll be, they'll be shot down within two weeks if they uh, get into the air. So uh, I think the, the, the most likely scenario is... Uh, by December, January, I think Ukraine will be done. I do not think that the West can continue to pour money into this rat hole. Uh, and because at the same time, Russia can continue putting military pressure, but they don't have to take the risks that are going to populate cemeteries in Russia. 
And, you know, there's been a lot of propaganda being spewed by the Ukrainian side and the U.S. side, uh, claiming that Russia has suffered enormous casualties, uh, you know, maybe three to four times what Ukraine has suffered. And I've always said that it's very easy to check that in the modern age of smartphones with cameras, and I don't care how oppressive a, a society is, you can't keep the images of, ce of cemeteries and grieving relatives off of social media. And the reality is Ukrainian pages are filled with images of cemeteries and freshly dug graves and having to dig up Soviet graves from World War II so they can plant uh, fresh bodies of Ukrainian soldiers. You're not seeing that on the Russian side. So um, Russia, they have not, if they decide to turn this into a war as opposed to a special military operation, then I think you will see a rapid, uh, decisive a defeat of, of Ukraine, but with that comes risk. So what's the difference between a special military operation and war? Number one, with a with a war, you will blow up the cities. There's not going to be any regard anymore for civilian losses. You will kill civilians. You will destroy the, the, the centers of government power. Every single one will be leveled. You're going to take out satellites. You're going to take out communication systems. And, and the risk that comes with this is the, the West may feel that they have no option but to try to use tactical nukes to, to stop Russia. So I think that you, going that full, you know, going the full Monty on war is something that uh, Russia wants to avoid. So I, I think the most, the most likely scenario is Ukraine is bleeding out in terms of manpower. It does not have an alternative source, economic source, to both fund its government and to tr build and train uh, you know, train soldiers and build a military equipment that it needs. It's dependent ult entirely on the West. They're like a they're like a drug addict, and they have to go out and find find their their, their supplier because without that supplier, they're going to go into withdrawal. On the subject of withdrawal, I wonder if you saw a story that appeared, I think, five days ago in the Wall Street Journal about the number of military amputees that have spread. Right grown since the beginning of the war, and it's up to perhaps 50,000. Um, I, th I thought the number is like 76,000, but well, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, a lot. Well, let's take 50,000 as the median number between sure. the lower estimate of 20,000 and the higher one of 76,000. So um, in the global war on terror, and this is assuming you – let's assume U.S. Army – levels of medevac competence, which is mm, questionable for the VSU. Um, if um, you were to multiply the number of uh, wounded that Ukraine has suffered by 25 on the basis of 50,000, you would uh, get a very frightening number of about 1.2 million wounded. And from that, on a one to three killed to wounded ratio, about almost 400,000 Ukrainian dead. Um, yeah. Now, this is something that's going to sound very childish, but I do have to ask it, because is this really plausible? Um, and I say, is this really plausible? Because these are the kind of KIA levels that Iraq sustained after 10 years at war with Iran. Can mm -hmm. this really be indeed plausible? Yes. No, it is very plausible. Number one, consider that the, the line of contact uh, where this conflict's taking place is about a thousand, you know, a thousand miles long almost. Um, and uh, so you, you're, you're spread out there. The, the primary weapon of choice is artillery, a uh, combination of artillery. Then on top of that, the, the cruise missiles and now the uh, the bombs, the fabs that are being dropped by uh, Russian aircraft. So uh, the the, ar the artillery is just devastating. And uh, the problem with Ukraine, they've been in they were initially in fixed positions, and that you know these they they had eight years to build these defensive lines, and so that's why Russia was very methodical in taking them apart. And in 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 the c course of that. Um, 
you know, people are they're they're in a trench and they're getting blown up. Uh, I think uh, what we've seen since the start of this counteroffensive, uh, the casualties, the, the kill killed in action on the Ukrainian side, have been approaching at least seven hundred a day. So just do the do the math on that. You're over forty thousand uh, that are that have been killed, and then you add to that. Uh, the, those wounded in action. Uh, there, there have been just some horrific videos of, uh, there was one Ukrainian unit that was pinned down in a minefield, and as the guys kept moving around trying to get on board a vehicle, they kept stepping on uh, landmines. And you literally you'd see the explosion, and you'd see them sitting there missing a uh, lower leg, a foot, a hand. Uh, so, I mean, it's, uh, you know, this is this is ugly business. But yeah, it's, uh, again, it's not just you say, well, that's Larry's opinion. Step back, look at the social media, because you can track this on social media. You can track it by looking at obituaries. Uh, you are not seeing this kind of losses on the Russian side that you're seeing on, on the Ukrainian side. And I don't care how good their medical system is. The, the, the volume of casualties is overwhelming them. That that's That's the problem. So, oh, Larry, um, you're prior CIA. I'm prior military. I want to circle back to the demilitarization of, of NATO now that we're seeing more hot spots around the world. Mm -hmm. um, so we've talked about attrition levels. I know I think you agree with me when I say that there's no way that the United States is going to put boots on the ground in Ukraine. But there already are boots on the ground in Africa, boots on the ground in Syria, additional boots on the ground now in well not on the ground, but in the Gulf of Hormuz. And we talked about demilitarization of NATO, how an economic like downturn of the United States of maintaining 750 bases worldwide is not very conducive to economic prowess, but how much do you think the United States is capable of maintaining a multi-war or multi-front war right now at this moment? Oh, they're not. I mean, that... <laughs> That's, that's what they're not that's no the, the that's what got me fired from uh, i was a fox news analyst back in uh 2002 and i was on the hannity and comb shows i think it was november 6th of 2002 and the question came up can the united states uh you know could we we were involved with the global war on terror in afghanistan can we fight the war in, in iraq and i said no the United States was not in a position where it could, we do not have the assets and ability to fight a two-front war. And this was 21 years ago. So today, we certainly do not. Um, and let, let's let's make note that so the, the, the U.S. troops that are there in Niger, there are, there are a couple of air bases that are flying drones. And so these are largely special operations forces. Uh, ditto for Syria. Syria's got a, a large contingent of both what's called special operations and is a, distinct from special forces. Special forces are Army Green Beret. Special operations forces are people from other select units that are uh, you know, known in television as SEAL Team 6 or Delta Force, uh, that kind of thing. Well, special operations forces and special forces, they do not have the military punch from a conventional that you'd expect from a conventional army and you need from a conventional army. Uh, Russia is not out there fighting with special operations forces at the, the tip of their spear. They've, they've got good old fashioned conventional integrated combined arms and combined arms means that you've got, you've got uh, guys on the ground. Uh, they're moving in, in units uh, that could be from, uh, 50 to 150 to 500. Well, they're in communication with uh, artillery, so they can call artillery strikes in. They're in communication with uh, fixed-wing aircraft and with helicopters. So the ground commander actually has the ability, should have the ability, to have instant communication with all these different support components that can help his unit deal with uh, with an enemy or a threat in a particular area. Well, that's that's not what special operations forces do. That's not what the guys in Syria are doing. And uh, the, the United States actually is has lost its ability from what it had, say, 30 years ago to conduct some combined arms. 
I mean, the, the, the reality is we've been the American uh, army, American military is the equivalent of the bully that goes around beating up kids in wheelchairs. OK, uh, we fought in Afghanistan. Oh, yeah. What were we fighting there? Uh, did uh, you remember the Afghan tank corps? Oh, yeah. They didn't have one. How about that artillery unit the Afghans, the Taliban had? Oh, they didn't have one of those either. They had some mortars. Well, the 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 Afghan Air Force, they were a powerful factor. <laughs> Whoops, they didn't have one of those either. So the United States has been fighting insurgents that do not have the military capabilities that Russia does. They're not prepared for it. They've they've got no experience. The last time the U.S. military fought a conventional force that had those kinds of capabilities was in the Korean War, 70 years ago. I, I think that really puts it in an amazing perspective because we always see these online debates that are like, <laughs> and when it's like, oh, China may get involved or, oh, North Korea may get involved. And all the Americans are like, they have no battle-tested soldiers. And it's like, neither do we, neither, yeah. neither do we. No, we don't. <laughs> I, I mean, I served 13 years and I, I never saw any combat. I can't remember the last time I fired a gun in military capacity. Like, I don't know yeah. what to think the experience we are getting, but I think people are under, because now we're so far removed from war, people are under the impression that these drone operators in Las Vegas are somehow like hardened and battle tested soldiers and, and Russia fights a different form of war. So yeah. it's just... Uh, Russia is very good at hybrid warfare, and I don't think that the United States is. Yeah, those those uh, guys and gals sitting there flying drones, their biggest problem is hemorrhoids and cholesterol, you know, so. From, uh, <laughs> Whether the Cheetos are, are in the yeah, vending get machine. Those, get those Cheeto stains off the fingers and don't, right, you know, don't I, transfer I don't, them to, to the joystick. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like people don't realize that that, is really the, like there's memes and then people joke around oh it's the they them army but our military is not ready for any sort of engagement that is like actual combat or even artillery i would say yeah no they we, well we're number one we're having trouble even producing the shells that they need uh so they, they'd be exhausted right now u.s u.s stockpiles would be su sufficient maybe to sustain uh intense combat for about two weeks and then we'd be out i mean it's that it's it's that bad yeah i've always you know donald trump always said wrongly the united states has got the greatest military in the world no we don't we've got the most expensive military in the world we do not have the greatest um the the ones that uh, is probably the the best army in the world in terms of uh actual combat capability is russia and it's, you know, it's hands down. The, the the thing, Russia did not build its reputation by invading other third world countries or second world countries, which didn't have robust militaries. You know, the United States, uh, we went into Iraq, you, you know, after years of having been the best buddy with Iraq, providing Iraq intelligence to defeat Iran, uh, providing Iraq with chemical weapons. And then all of a sudden we say, okay, you're no longer our friend. We're going to attack you. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, Iraq did not have the kind of military capability that was uh, could match up with the United States. Uh, but that's not the case with Russia. And yet Russia's not eager to get out and get into a shooting war with the United States and, and with Europe. Because, uh, you know, Russia, more than any other, the only other country outside of Russia that knows the human cost of, in terms of loss of life is China. Because in World War II, Russia lost like 27 million people. China lost 36 million. Uh, the United States, we lost 470,000 total in Europe, the Pacific, Africa. For, and that's all, all military branches you know, air, air, Navy, Army, Marines, but 470,000. That's the, the Russians lost that many in just the Battle of Stalingrad. So like I said the United States has no, the American people have no current memory of those kinds of things. And that's why it's, you know, we've got a sort of a Hollywood shaped image of the world. 
I think on the subject of a Hollywood-shaped image of the world, then the big news clearly for the last two months has been the Ukrainian counteroffensive. And I <laughs> must here <laughs> confess um, that I wrote a more pessimistic assessment two months two or three months before it started about how it would go. I thought the Ukrainians would at least get through the first defensive line. So even someone like me who's watched the conflict quite closely yeah. has uh, been surprised by how both well the Russian military has performed in this counteroffensive and how relatively poorly the AFU has performed. But this is not to talk about me. This is actually to yeah. talk about, <laughs> as you often focus on, how the analysis of what is going on is framed, particularly in mainstream media, and it seems at a governmental level in the West, because what I get the sense from watching everything is that they're just confused and that they have no idea what's going on. But before we get to that, I want to examine something else, because when it is often said in the West that the Russians are performing poorly, they will talk about in the West in the United States and Great Britain here, which are primarily in the languages and countries that I read because I speak, speak English, um, they will talk about how we beat Saddam's army in 1990-91 and in 2003, and he had this huge military with all this military equipment, artillery, and an air force, and we just absolutely thrashed it. We lost only 292 guys in Gulf War One and killed 50,000 Iraqis and... 30 to 40,000, or they'll say something a lot more ridiculous, like 100,000 yeah. Russians have, have died. So they're absolutely pathetic. They have no idea what they're doing. Okay. Why is Ukraine in 2022, 2023, and Iraq in 1990, 91, so at the height of Saddam's military machine, why are these two situations not comparable? Well, what for starters, yeah, for, for starters, uh, Ukraine was never part of joint NATO exercises and joint U.S. military exercises. Uh, they were supplied, in fact, with a, a lot of then Soviet equipment, uh, not modern U.S. equipment. Uh, the United States was able to persuade several of the Iraqi commanders to surrender their forces and not fight and oppose the United States. Uh, and the United States had uh, in the, you know, from, say, 1991, <clears throat> the end of the first uh, Gulf War uh, to, to 2003, had been able to attrit uh, the uh, Iraqi Air Force. Uh, that, that was not the case uh, with Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine, as I noted earlier, represented the second largest army in NATO in terms of manpower. And it wasn't just manpower. They had received uh, training on everything from uh, maritime operations to uh, tank, uh, how you maneuver and tank battalions, uh, to uh, in information warfare. Uh, there was uh, at this uh, one post out in western Ukraine, Lavariv, uh, that was a de facto NATO base. Uh, in fact, NATO was training of uh, the, the Ukrainians and how to do offensive computer network operations, in other words, hacking attacks. So uh, just from that standpoint alone, uh, the Ukrainian army was probably better trained than either the British, the German, or the French army for actual military operations against the Russians. So the you know the, the people making those comparisons it's just, it's just it's nonsense and okay let's let's go with that comparison how did it turn out for the United States great victory huh oh that's right they couldn't contain an insurgency and they couldn't conquer the country and at the end we ended up paying off a bunch of shakes not to blow us up that that's that was the the, the David Petraeus counterterrorism you know he took credit for. Uh, a big counterterrorism operation, but the reality was we were paying off shakes to, to pay guys not to plant bombs. That's how we quote one. So I, I defy anyone to lay out the great victory that the United States has enjoyed in either Syria, Afghanistan, or Iraq. Doesn't exist. Uh, true, but then they will uh, compare unfavorably um, 
the uh, slow going approach or often defensive attitude of the Russians with us smashing through the Iraqi defenses in 1991. You remember 73 yeah. Easting destroying the Tawil Khanna. So again, what exactly about these two situations is not analogous here for the purpose of, say, imagine a U.S. officer or British officer saying, we destroyed that and did it without any losses. The pathetic Russians can't even manage to do that and suffer heavier casualties. That is why we would destroy them, because we're clearly much better. Why would you tell this guy, OK, this is what you're missing? Yeah, well, the the, the problem, I, I guess I have I, I challenge the premise of your question because you're assuming that in talking to this person, you can lay out facts and that they are amenable to reason. And they'll, they'll go, oh, I didn't know that. No, you're you're not dealing with people who are willing to engage on facts and, and and take an objective look at reality. You're talking blind ideologues. It it does not matter what Russia does. No matter what Russia does within the West calculus, Russia's weak, Russia's bad. Uh, Russia's evil. Do you know that Russia's an imperial power? So, and I, I, I've heard that from a couple of knuckleheads. One was a Ukrainian uh, rep in the United States. I got to debate him on uh, Iran TV, press TV. And he started about Russia's imperial power. So, oh, wait, please tell, please tell me the name of the country, the last country that Russia conquered militarily. Well, you can't name it because Russia has not been an imperial power. If we like to claim that because Russia controlled the lands immediately on its borders, that that made it an empire. Well, uh, when you add up the United States, what it's done in terms of invading other countries, please. UK, ditto. France, ditto. Germany, you know, uh, just go down the list of the European countries that have built up colonial outposts in Africa. Yet the meme is that Russia is keen on taking over the world and expanding its empire. And you really don't have an example of Russia in the last 30 years, at least, of going out conquering territory militarily simply because it decided that it had an issue with one particular country. It went into Georgia after it was attacked, and it put up with Ukraine bombing Russian speakers for 14, you know, for nine years before finally, finally acting. So the those that want to draw that parallel, they're going to draw it. And there's, there's not a thing you can do to convince them. But the thing that will uh, ultimately force them to come around is when the Ukrainian army is defeated. And it is going to be defeated. It, is, it, it does not have the depth of manpower and leadership that it can replenish as Russia continues to inflict casualties. So let's go back around to the first premise that I did before I took us on the sidetrack to bring us back to the beginning. OK, so yeah. the Ukrainian counteroffensive <clears throat> has gone badly. But here's something that has struck me is that in news articles and even official statements like with that stupid thing that the UK MOD puts out every day. Of, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's it's minefields. Oh, yeah. it's helicopter gunship. It's helicopter gunships, and also even after all of this, uh, Russian morale is very, very bad. Or people who are connected, like Mark Galliotti, will write what well, after saying in March and April in articles, and I complained, and I have the receipts on that. That uh, Russian morale is very poor. That they will run away. Now saying, well, no one said the Russians would just run away. <laughs> Why did they think the Russians would just run away, and why is it that they are looking at – there is one thing, mines, helicopter gunships with um, long-range missiles that explain the failure, instead of looking at what you can see in the footage, which is that, no, it's mines and it's artillery, because once the Ukrainians get hit a mine and their columns stop, the Russians pour on artillery fire – or there's infantry nearby that engages them with ATGMs, and then the tanks come in and pour a uh, fire onto there and yeah. the artillery. And so it's clearly a combined arms approach. It's all of these things. Why are they just looking at it? Oh, this one little thing, if only we can overcome it, explains all of the problems instead of looking at the whole weapons systems and how they work together as the Russians use them to explain what's going on. What's up with that? Yeah, yeah, the quick answer is they're terrible analysts. 
So let, let, let's start with the construction of the Surovikin lines, the defensive lines in southern uh, Ukraine that uh, General Surovikin started putting together uh, 1st of October last year. Now, it was reported in the news, Ukraine and NATO, with their ISR, their intelligence surveillance reconnaissance platforms, they could see that being built. Why wasn't that line ever attacked while it was under construction? Why? Because if you've got a military that's capable of projecting force, it would seem to me the last thing you want to do is let the Russians build defensive lines unmolested. But that's what happened. So what does that tell you? Here's what it tells me. It tells me that Ukraine then and now lacked the ability of long-range artillery, lacked combat air, they lacked, they had no credible means of launching a sustained attack on those construction workers who were not armed. So let's start with that. And then we jump ahead to the, the very simple fact that if you're going to send any unit on the ground, either on foot or in vehicle, yes, they're going to have to transit minefields. So one way you deal with minefields is you use combat air and large bombs that can hit and detonate and open up pathways. But Ukraine didn't do that because it does not have that kind of air. It doesn't have enough of that aircraft to do it. How about they could have used helicopters to fly support uh, behind the troops as they advanced uh, because they, they, they wanted to be able to shoot at any Russian artillery, any Russian uh, air defense system, any you know Russian tanks that were bought. They didn't do that because they don't have those. So at the outset of this counteroffensive, there was, you, you know, you didn't have to be Clausewitz or Sun Tzu to, to figure out that it was going to go nowhere because they did not have the combat power that is required with mobile air defense, mobile artillery, and fixed-wing aircraft to support ground troops as a genuine combined arms operation. This wasn't combined arms. This was, th this was a, a suicide. I think that's a good way of putting it. But then that does beg the question. You could clearly see that someone like Scott Ritter could see that. Clearly, the Russian general staff could see that. What made them th think that this could just succeed? Why did they just did they plug in? Um, as Scott Ritter suggested in a video a few months ago, into the simulation computer to make it all add up, Russian morale factor, say, one instead of eight or yeah, yeah. whatever. Um, did they just do that in, out of hope or did they do it out of belief and therefore think confidently or in hope? Which one was it, that they were confident or in hope that the Russians would run away? Well, it was an entirely hope. There was no, in there was no intelligence. Uh, behind this at all. You know, as you said, you know, well, several of us saw it. Hell, I, I argue Helen Keller could have seen this coming. You know, you didn't have to have 2020 vision to figure this out. So what you're looking at is willful blindness that instead of, uh, and this flows from the leadership, the leadership was not demanding of the intel community the hard answers, because the political leadership had already made up its mind what the outcome was. And it didn't matter what you would say to them. I know for a fact that the analysts who tried to make the case that Russia military capability was greater than that being presented, they were they were removed from the account and in one case lost their job. So um, you know, that sends a chilling message to the analysts. So they say, okay, they only want to hear happy talk. So we're going to give them happy talk. And we're not going to tell them the reality of, well, the, the Russians can mobilize 1.5 million people. They're, they're, they're wreaking havoc 
on Ukraine right now at the outset of the special military op operation with just 90,000 troops, even though they were outnumbered almost six, uh, six to one. The Russians were thumping the Ukrainians soundly at the outset of that special military operation. That should have told any analyst worth their salt that, hey, the, the Russians are no joke. Are, are they a perfect military unit? Oh, well, heavens no. They're human beings. And they make mistakes too. But uh, the, uh, the consequences, we see it on the ground in, in a whole variety of ways. Mariupol. Remember when the Russians were in the process of taking Mariupol. It's a, somewhat akin to the Battle of Stalingrad. So at, at any point during that battle, did you see Ukraine mount up an armored division uh, or an army to come to the rescue of its troops in Mariupol? No. Well, why not? Because they couldn't do it. They did not have that capability. So you know, they took great uh, great pride in, oh, boy, we drove the Russians out of uh, Kharkiv. Well, when you look at, they're taking back a bunch of empty farmland. And, and Russia wisely made the decision, we don't have enough troops. They did not have enough uh, numbers at that time. Uh, and so they weren't going to sit there and fight suicidal battles and just lose people because they didn't want to give up a tree stump. And so this is... Um, I, I mean, I, I've heard it from, uh, I've got friends on the inside who are still involved with the military intelligence. And the the, the senior leadership is, uh, they're, they're, they're willfully blind. They're just closing their eyes or they're hearing what they want to hear. And uh, they're not coming to grips with the reality of what's taking place on the ground. We've talked about ideologues on here, and you talk about ideologues very articulately, and so do your guest writers on your blogs. But let me ask a bit of a provocative question and stop me if it's too provocative. Is the kind of process at work here, are we saying that you know Putin is isolated, he only hears what he wants to hear uh, because that's the way dictatorships at work, whereas we're a democracy? Um, right. Are we in the West actually operating in certain senses in that way of uh, the boss wants to hear what he wants to hear, and you're fired if you don't uh, tell him or her what they want to hear. Are we operating more like a dictatorship? Yeah, well, this is, uh, I don't think you're old enough to remember the Cold War and the, the good old days in the 70s and 80s. Um, uh, I see just frightening parallels between what the Soviet Union was in the 70s and what the United States is today. Uh, one of the characteristics of the Soviet Union in the 70s was the leadership was sclerotic. They were all these elderly gents, you know, Leonid Brezhnev, Yuri Andropov, uh, uh, Gromyko, uh, you know, they, they, it looked like an escape from a nursing home. Well, look at the United States. We got, you know, jumping Joe Biden, and Nancy Pelosi, where does she leave her teeth? And Steny Hoyer and Chuck Schumer. Uh, and, you know, Donald Trump, God love him, but he's still a 78-year-old man. He's at least in a lot better shape than those folks. But the, the elderly component of U.S. leadership uh, is, it is very reminiscent of what was taking place in the, in the Soviet Union back then. And then Pravda, uh, truth uh, was uh, was a, a joke. You, you know, they would they would literally uh, like Baghdad Bob to be in denial of reality. Well, we're seeing that now in the United States um, with our media. I was, you know, I became a TV talking head in, in on cable news back in 1994, first on CNN, and then I was on every every single channel: Fox, MSNBC, ABC. I was on Nightline uh, probably 12 times. I was on the Jim Lehrer News Hour. And frequently, I would be on with somebody who had an alternative point of view. But we could argue it out, or we, we would uh, we'd be able to present different positions. You're not seeing that at all now in the United States. Nobody from my side of the house, as far as 
the, the saying that the war in Ukraine is lost and the Ukrainians are losing is allowed on any of the major television networks. Doug McGregor got on once in a while when Tucker Carlson was still at Fox, but that was the exception. So, so now what you have is just this monolith of opinion that it's it's the Amen Choir. Everybody's singing from the same sheet of music. It's just the problem is it's it's badly written music and it's not true. So you you don't have an honest debate that's allowed anywhere in the United States, and part of that is because of the corporate control of the media. It has been consolidated in such a small number of hands, and the people that own those outlets are able to exert enormous control over what people say and do. So you're not getting any kind of genuine debate anymore. We, you know, we have to come to outlets like yours to try to present some alternative uh, perspective on all this. Well, we do what we can. We do have a question from a subscriber that we would like to ask you, and uh, we select the, we select these carefully, of course, to make sure that we think that they're worthwhile to our guests, and we certainly think this one was. And it concerns the release of the Azov commanders, mm -hmm. so from one of our subscribers. Is it possible that this was a move by the White House to force Erdogan to release these commanders before the NATO summit in Vilnius and before the expiration of the grain agreement with Russia? Was this a way of the United States trying to um, deepen a, a split between Erdogan and Putin and remove any trust between the two? Well, it, clearly it had a negative effect on Russian-Turkish relations, as far as Putin and Erdogan go, I think this. I think this was entirely Erdogan. I, I don't. He was trying to curry favor with the White House and curry favor with you with Europe at the expense of his relationship with Russia, and he miscalculated. Uh, look, the release of those uh, those five commanders is means nothing strategically or tactically. I think they were probably themselves upset that they were going to now face going back into the meat grinder and, and are un, un, not likely to survive if they do go back into combat. But <clears throat> Erdogan really alienated uh, Putin over that. And they just had a call the other day and the Russians made it very clear that, you know, they're keeping, they're keeping Erdogan at arm's length. He's got a lot of groveling to do to get back into uh, anything approaching good graces with Putin. But it, it was all done as theater from Erdogan's standpoint, trying to uh, curry favor. So he wanted to get the deal for the uh, F-16s with the United States, and he wanted to uh, be get a welcome into, into Europe. And, and Europe doesn't want the Turks. They don't consider them European. Well, there are two Muslim for Europe and two European yeah. for Muslim. <laughs> Yeah. Poor Turks just kind of stuck in the middle geopolitically and culturally. Right. Um, so in closing, um, I always say to people and I say, you know, we're already in World War Three. Like this is this is it. Like we're all part of it. So and for, from my perspective, the battle for Ukraine is done. That's that's done for all intents and purposes. It's won by Russia. We're moving into the battlefront, Syria. Iran and Africa, what happens next? Does another front open in Europe, Eastern Europe? Does another front open in Taiwan? I mean, whether these fronts are very active or hot, they're still war fronts. So what, where are we going? Well, I, th I think one of the things we're going to start seeing is the United States is going to be forced to retreat from certain areas. I'm not sure how much longer it can stay in Syria. And, um, you know, it's going to, I think it's going to be more casualties there. And, and there really is no good justification for being in Syria other than wanting to control the oil um, that's out in the uh, uh, eastern province uh, of Syria. So uh, you, you look at Africa again, the U.S., uh, the presence of AFRICOM in places like Niger, Mali, uh, Burkina Faso um, is it, it, it's designed to go after, quote, terrorist targets. So far, at least in Niger, the Nigerians are not angry at the Americans. At least that's what I hear from a friend that's uh, connected and uh, is in a, in a position to know. But they're very angry at the French. 
So you've got this growing movement around the world of divorcing uh, countries, divorcing themselves from their colonial past and demanding a more equitable relationship going forward. Now, this gets to the victory of Russia in this war, because it's not just a matter of defeating uh, the Ukrainians militarily and by extension, defeating NATO. It's being able to establish themselves as a legitimate alternative power in the world. And part of that's going to be on the economic front, because already you've got China and Russia working to create an alternative to uh, the dollar reserve currency, which has dominated the economics for the last 60 years. What the, one of the problems with all of that, though, is China is really in, in, in some serious economic trouble. And I'm not sure Russia is big enough to pull the Chinese out of it. But if China is going to be in economic trouble, it's, uh, the United States and Europe is not going to be far behind because this contraction that's taking place with international trade uh, on some fronts is, is it, it's going to work its way through the system and is, it's not going to promote job growth and uh, economic growth. Uh, but it might uh, in promote worlds apart as uh, mm -hmm. very bad an outcome as that would be. Well, I think we are coming here towards the end of our time, but I know that we've all enjoyed this very much, Larry, and I think our listeners will, and I think after listening to this, they'll definitely want to hear from you more. So we've mentioned it at the beginning, but where can they find you to get more of your insights? Sonar21.com, S-O-N-A-R-2-1.com. That's, that's my outlet. That's my uh, emotional therapy place. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, folks, for having me. It's, uh, I read you guys all the time, and it's uh, always nice to make a connection one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you very much, Larry. And thank you to all our listeners. And thanks, Lydia, for actually showing up today and not being on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Lydia is on vacation again. She's not even with us anymore. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Have a good week, rest of your weekend, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>